so we will now welcome Kalpana here to have her presentation. So you are warmly welcome, Kalpan. Thank you so very much, Erika, and a very good morning to all of you. And uh, thank you for uh, welcoming me and giving me the time uh, to highlight certain issues. So I'll uh, share my screen now and hopefully we can get started. Yeah. Yes. Looks looks beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Right. In terms of setting up the context for today's presentation, uh, it's important for us to know that the Faroe Islands is a small nation of roughly fifty-four thousand people, and uh, in terms of the linguistic context, it's spoken by seventy-two thousand people, both within and outside the islands. And given the historical connection to Denmark, uh, in terms of the Faroe Islands belonging to the Kingdom of Denmark, Danish had been the language of education, of church, of justice uh, until uh, the 60s. So uh, the, the permission or the freedom to see Faroese in its official context is uh, roughly uh, fairly new in the islands. And, and one can only imagine the frustration and attitudes of the ethnic Faroese people in not having their own language acknowledged in their own territory. So only very recently uh, has that in the last, uh, what is it, 60 odd years, that uh, Faroese becomes the official language of the islands. And having said that, though the Faroese uh, language is now very clearly present in uh, in the Faroe Islands, there is still a dependency on Danish given its membership in the Kingdom of Denmark. And so a lot of ethnic Faroese are almost simultaneous bilingual with, when it comes to Faroese and Danish, which means then for immigrants coming into the country, there's a double challenge, perhaps comparable to that in Finland, where the Swedish part of Finland would require that the immigrants master both Finnish and Swedish. So there is uh, this dichotomy of which do I choose, which is more important. Uh, but the current policy is that immigrants learn Faroese and somehow they will have to focus on acquiring Danish as well. So in terms of policy making, that adds a layer of complexity uh, to Faroese uh, society. Uh, there are roughly 6% immigrants, uh, and that would be counting uh, those who've come for family reunification and those who are have come in as laborers. So it's roughly 6%, and the immigrants are from over 100 different nations and speaking about 70 languages. The, the education directive, uh, government directive in 10, 2020, uh, speaks of allowing child and children immigrants to be able to be taught in their own L1 or the more emotive mother tongue. But that has not been implemented. And that came in because they acknowledge that you have to master your L1, be comfortable in it and be focused and rooted in it for you to be able to learn an L2 in the ideal age of up to three to five years. So the first time, in 2020, that was acknowledged by the Faroese authorities. In terms of Faroese, Faroese is not a minority language, despite the small number uh, that speak it uh, relatively. It is uh, it's minoritized. And that is because the distinction being that it is the language of government, of education, of the justice system, and constantly uh, heard and spoken in Faroese society. It is also the medium of instruction right from the kindergarten up to university levels. But here comes in another challenge. Academic materials are not available in Faroese to the extent that you can fully rely on Faroese. A possible at the primary school level, very, very slowly starting at the upper secondary, but uh, very 
small in percentage in what the university can use uh, in teaching the various uh, subjects. There are five faculties in our university. And so this kind of creates a challenge, because, particularly for immigrant students who also have to know Danish and Norwegian, perhaps, for academic texts. Though today, increasingly, it's the English academic texts, except in the faculty of Faroese, that tend to dominate, particularly the sciences um, and, and so on. And therefore, there's a protectionist attitude uh, towards Faroese, which is completely understandable because it is a language spoken by 72,000 people. And increasingly, um, English is making its uh, presence felt as it is everywhere in the world as lingua franca, um, which is which makes uh, people nervous about uh, Faroese being uh, affected by it. But in, in the social discourse, it's the immigrants who are blamed for English becoming popular. It's an illogical responsibility given to the immigrants, uh, uh, considering that every screen in the house of every individual is blaring English into one's living rooms and bedrooms and whatnot. So for the immigrant to be held responsible uh, for the spreading of English is uh, fallacious. So, uh, so in this context, there's an anti-immigrant discourse and sometimes a lack of acknowledgement of English as lingua franca and our young people would be disadvantaged if they cannot cope in English in a global society because the Faroes is very keen on being an international player. Now, in recent years, there's been a lot of discussion about teaching Faroese as a second language. And that discussion comes not from a genuine interest in the immigrants, but in being able to put certain formal requirements for immigration in place. Now, it's no secret that Denmark is the strict, one of the strictest nations when it comes to immigrants, immigration and immigrants. It has been often criticized by the European Union uh, for its um, lack of humanity, so to speak, in its attitude towards uh, immigration. And because the Faroes is still very much a part of the Kingdom of Denmark, we indulge in what is called policy borrowing, which requires then that uh, an exam is passed and that you are taught Faroese culture. So there is, um, when it comes to teaching Faroese as a second language, uh, the Ministry of Education gave the university a one-off opportunity to design a course in Faroese as a second language. I was one of the instructors in the course and we had 19 students. And these 19 students comprise compulsory school teachers as also upper secondary or pre-university teachers. We have 48 compulsory schools and we have five upper secondary schools. So 19 teachers is not a fair representation. And what can one teacher do in a school? But what it has done is create awareness, which I believe is always the first step to change. Um, in the exams that we conducted, every single uh, student in this 19 student group acknowledged how much their knowledge of second language acquisition has taught them about how it is to receive the immigrants and ensure that, we, that you teach with respect for the immigrants L1 plus the importance of knowing Faroese as the language of the nation. And that cultural sensitivity and understanding of how language is linked to identity becomes evident for these 19 people. And I think that is an important step in the development. Now, that course is over, or it's the final phase is being conducted now. And so far, the government has shown no interest in continuing to offer the course. Uh, and there is no formal government directive underpinning the course, though it has uh, it's it's been running now and it will run for another six months. And therefore, given the proportion, there are not that many teachers who are qualified to teach Faroese as a second language. Um, because inclusion, social justice, equity and education is not part of the discourse, uh, either at the governmental level or at the societal level. And this lack of interest and focus on inclusion, unfortunately, is also part of my teacher education faculty, which only now is slowly thinking of offering 
the teaching of Faroese as a second language as part of one of the specialized subjects for pre-service teachers or teacher trainees to choose. Often Faroese as a second language is taught by Faroese teachers and therein lies the dichotomy because often, as in most countries, teachers of the L1 are by de definition nationalistic and there is that battle between preserving the purity of the language and doing and ensuring that the learning outcomes of the students are maintained. So there's that interesting uh, dynamic there. Uh, for adult immigrants, we have the evening school and they have just recently implemented the common European uh, framework of reference for foreign languages. And you have to pass certain exams towards getting a permanent residence or citizenship. And the evening school itself has organized what we call reception classes, where all immigrant children are gathered together. So they are in a milieu where they are safe and secure and they share commonality of challenges and problems. And, they are, and it, they've had it now for two years and it's been tremendously successful in helping students get back into their own schools after the evening school. Now, there's a discussion that the reception classes should become a formal part of the compulsory school instead of being part of the evening school. So in general, it is not unfair to say that there is lack of equity and social justice in education as my research has shown and the articles I have published also reveal. Um, as an immigrant, I came to the Pharaohs in May, on May 18th, in a few days, it'll be 32 years. I came in 1991. Uh, I'm married to an Indian who had already been in the Pharaohs for eight years. We met on one of his trips to India, and I had to wait nine months after I, we got married in 1990 to get a visa to join him. When I came to the Faroe Islands, um, the amount of hours that you could get to learn Faroese was 30 hours in all. 30 hours, no more, no less. And it's still the case um, in many places, but slowly it's changing with the CEFR framework that has been introduced. So I'm self-taught because contrary to the host nation, uh, placing a lot of influence on learning the language immediately, for me, the culture shock of entering a new nation of hearing, constantly hearing a language that I did not understand. I came in as an educated academic to the Faroe Islands and it threatened my sense of self-confidence and self-efficacy to, to function like a helpless child. And then as nature would have it, I was not very young when I came and I wanted to have kids. So the first Faroese class I attended for evening, was an evening class, it's an hour and a half. I ran out to throw up seven times because I was pregnant. <laughs> so I had no chance of learning the language formally. So I started to learn it informally, where my goal, very clear goal was fluency and not accuracy. Today I speak the language fluently, but not that many mistakes they tell me. I'm very keen on celebrating my differences. They don't worry me. I'm not scared of them. I am who I am. And from the very beginning, my husband and I have been focused on ensuring that our son's Faroese identity is clear to them. Because research shows second generation immigrant children suffer from a conflict of identity. And we did not want that uh, for our sons. So we did not mind. It didn't really affect us if that's what they wanted. And that's what they chose. Um, our oldest son, who, who was seven years old when his younger brother was born, uh, we was going on a walk, pushing the pram together with my husband and myself. And his teacher comes in the opposite side. And our seven-year-old older son tells the teacher, uh, these are my parents, they are Indian. That's my little brother in the pram and I, and we are Faroese. He was just seven years old when he said that. And that was uh, at the same time heartening and a little uh, bit of sorrow. But we thought it was important for the sons not to have a conflict, conflict in that identity. Today, my identity is Indian Faroese, and I say that with confidence. Nothing is robbed, nothing is lost in acquiring that dual identity. 
I chose integration over assimilation because I'm one who is keen on celebrating my differences because I think they give me a strength. And therefore, my culture is fluid, as culture normally is in an individual. Uh, so when I go to India, I'm able to slip back into that culture without any shock. And when I return to the ferries, it's that same seamless entering back into what today is very much my home and where my heart is. Um, the area of challenge, of course, is when I speak of social justice and education, when I speak of inclusion, when I speak of the importance of Peruvian as a second language being taught, people hear the immigrant, they don't hear the academic who's conducted research in the field. So that's the conflict. Uh, every time I'm interviewed on TV or on radio or, uh, or for some school magazine, that people forget that I speak with a certain authority that comes from being an academic and not necessarily just an immigrant. Thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, and feel free to ask any questions should you want to. We, we give hand to Talapada for a wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation. And now we have a little bit of time, so I have many questions, but students, do you want to comment or ask something? Thank you. For this very uh, thoughtful and insightful presentation, it was very interesting to hear the, your perspectives of how it is to be included and how it is to come with the dual uh, identity. I was wondering a little bit about um, the the attitudes towards the different languages. I mean, there has to be lots of conflicts uh, because some languages you ha I mean you have to learn Danish and then there. Uh, fairies. So could you say something about the attitudes towards languages? Yeah, thank you for that uh, important question. Because yes, uh, the attitude towards the Danish language is slowly changing. It was once considered natural to learn Danish, but slowly and surely English is taking over that role. And there's a lot of discourse about uh, why do we need Danish? Because we have a cultural identity that we can share with Scandinavians anyway. And we learn Danish up to the ninth or 10th grade, as the case may be. So is there any need for Danish to continue? So three years ago, Danish became no longer compulsory for people in the upper secondary or the pre-university, except for those who chose uh, humanities with language as the focus. So, for example, my second son did not choose Danish in upper secondary. He switched over uh, to uh, as, uh, no, in fact, he didn't have to switch over to anything. It was English and Faroese, and that is it. So uh, for immigrant children, obviously, that's an advantage. But it also brings that interesting question. We always speak of being no society today unless very, very few isolated communities are monolingual. We are either bilingual and most probably multilingual. So the interesting uh, uh, discussion is at what point does learning an additional language stop contributing to that complexity and ability to think at an abstract level? Is it L3? Is it L4? So, so often there is that discussion as well, how many languages do you actually need to learn to supposedly benefit from the ability to be abstract, which comes and a, a critical reflection, which comes easier when you have several languages? Uh, so Danish, the position of Danish is not what it used to be, um, because the younger generation have an alternative life online, and English is the lingua franca there. So there is that tension, absolutely. The attitude towards Danish, uh, particularly the younger generation, it could be pragmatic, but they're not particularly emotionally uh, tied to it, majority of them. English for the young people is something they take for granted, and they like to think they do it well. They speak it well, but they speak it in a particular idiolect that is part of the communities that they are members of. Because teachers tell me they don't write it as well as they ought to. Um, so the resentment of English is more when it's seen as a threat to Faroese. Um, and it is completely understandable. I hope I, I kind of touched upon what you were looking for. 
Thank you, Kalpana. So really like fairies, we don't know so much about it. That's why I was so fascinated to listen to these details because seriously, so we lack of knowledge from this little island and, and the people from there and the language. So I was really fascinated to listen to your presentation. But I will have many questions, but I know we don't have too much time, but I will ask that, um, is fairy language linguistically close to Danish? Or is it linguistically very different language? Like, are you able to? Yeah, it's different, but it's close to um, more close to Icelandic than it would to the okay. Danish uh, language. The Faroese language helps the Faroese people to be able to follow Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish, and depending on uh, their familiarity with Icelandic. So, the very fact that you learn Faroese is a key to several of the other Scandinavian or Nordic languages. So okay, very, very interesting. Natural asset that uh, Faroese speakers have. But perhaps what is interesting is, as much as they acknowledge they have that advantage, they forget when immigrants come in, Faroese is perhaps the immigrant's fifth language. And I often ask my teacher trainee students, what can you do in Swedish with the Swedish language? What do you mean when you say you understand Swedish? To what extent? So to have respect so, for the immigrant experience, where Faroese might be L5 or L6 for that matter. So are you using uh, at the university, are you using as a teaching, are you using English or this Faroese? In my language? course, uh, the medium of instruction is English because I teach. The teaching of English is a foreign language. Okay. Um, but if there's doubt, then I, I switch over to uh, Faroese to explain concepts that they might struggle with. But in mm -hmm. other courses, uh, Faroese is spoken, unless, of course, it's a Dane teaching. And 98% of Danes would speak Danish. We do have exceptions in our faculty, Danes who speak Faroese fluently. But normally they don't, because when they're struggling with Faroese, people switch over to Danish and the Danes continue. So they could have stayed 30, 40, 50 years in the Faroes without speaking the language. <laughs> Okay, very, very interesting. I really want to love to come to Fairy Island to visit there. It All sounds of you so are very incredible. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you so much, Kalpana. And thank you. And we are happy to hear you. And we welcome now. Um, thank you. Yes, with the next presentation we have here uh, Knut coming to tell about his PhD. Hello. Challenges to music education and language in Fairy Island. So please, Knut, you are warmly welcome here. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen also. Here. Let's see. There we go. Um, all right, yeah, so thank you for having me. Um, and thank you, Kalpana. I have plenty of questions to, but we can save that for later, thankfully. Uh, I hope to add a bit to the knowledge of, of uh, Faroese society and culture. My emphasis is, is uh, music. I have a background in music as a musician for many years and uh, as a musicologist. Um, and I'm currently doing my PhD uh, project at the University of the Faroe Islands at Faculty of Education. Today, I'm gonna uh, give a brief overview of Faroese music uh, with an emphasis on traditional music from pre-modern times until our times. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on the relationship between language and music. And then I'll give a brief introduction to the theme of my PhD project with a focus on music tradition and music education. And the title of my PhD project is The Concept of the Faroese in Music Education, Negotiating Identity and Notions of Tradition. <clears throat> so if we look at the Faroe Islands from a, a music historical perspective, it can uh, generally be divided into two uh, eras or 
uh, periods, one of them very long from, from the Middle Ages until around uh, the year 1900, plus minus uh, 50 years, uh, which was the traditional vocal music. Uh, and then the instrumental, etc. music, which is from around 1900 until today. Because the, the main uh, characteristic of uh, early traditional music in the Faroe Islands was the lack of instruments, the, the absence of instruments in the islands. Uh, so it was uh, a vocal music that was developed in those times. And then from around 1850 until 1950, instruments become much more common. The first church organs arrived, the first one arrived in 1831. And and instruments become more common because the the trade and the, the connections to the outside world become more regular and the instruments are imported, the European instruments of different kinds. Um, so, I mean, just to say that if this was a, a European perspective, we would have many epochs from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance and to the classical music and romanticism, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so this is a different perspective. Um, so the music in the Pharaohs before 1900 was a vocal music, but the main, the main, the most, uh, what shall we say, the most iconic uh, representation of this is the Pharaohese chain dance for the Skudanser which has survived uh, for a, a very long time, uh, supposedly since the Middle Ages. At some point, the earliest written uh, source on the Faroese chain dance is from the 1600s, but most likely it's it's uh, much older than that. And then we have the Kvaye, which are the heroic ballads, which are chanted along with the Faroese chain dance. And then we have the ballads, Ruiser, more general ballads. Um, then there's a form of church singing, Kinko Sanker, which was, uh, there was a Danish uh, composer of, or, and collector of uh, hymns who released uh, a gradual uh, a hymnal book in 1699. His name was Thomas Kinko. And uh, his book, the Kinko books made it to the pharaohs, but there were no organs in the pharaohs. So people developed this uh, strange form of singing, which to modern ears sounds almost uh, microtonal, because if you don't have any organ accompaniment, uh, there's no uh, set harmony and there's no set rhythm. So people start to develop their own uh, individual singing. It's, it's individ individual, but collective and Today, this mainly exists on, on recordings from the early and mid 20th century, but there are a few people who still perform this, a few specialists. And then there are the shelter, which are children's rhymes. Um, so these are all combinations of, of ballads, of lyrics, language and singing, chanting, music and, and it is a, a basic characteristic that the music is used to uphold the language, the lyrics, the stories that we tell each other. The music is carrying the, the, the lyrics. Uh, and there is a clear absence of instrumental music until the 20th century. So in the in the early 20th century, uh, the, the influx of, of new, uh, new ideas and, and well, instruments and, well, modernity makes its, its impact. Uh, it, it causes a lot of changes. Uh, so singing, uh, communal singing, singing together becomes a much more widespread phenomenon. And today the communal singing is considered to be a... a tradition, but it is, oh, sorry, oops, how do I get back? There we are. Um, so singing outside of church and dance settings becomes a tradition in the 20th century. And today it is very common for people to sing together 
And school singing has played a significant role in this. Uh, and the early 20th century also saw the first uh, song composers in the Faroe Islands. And they were following the earliest poets who wrote national romantic poetry in Faroese. And they followed the, the national movement, the, the, the national the nationalist movement in the late 1800s. It was like a, a, a late awakening in the Faroes after there, everyone else in, in mainland Europe had had uh, had their their national awakening. The the imagined community of of the nation, uh, and the Faroese also wanted a part in this. Uh, so there is always again in this, even though this is a break with the earlier traditions, there's still these close ties between lyrics and singing in modern Faroese music. And, and it's quite late that any instrumental music is composed in the Faroes. It's, it's not until 1949 that the first instrumental composition is released as, as, as score music, which is quite late in a, in a European perspective. And today there's obviously lots of different musics, but this this tie between uh, the, ly the lyrics and, and the music is, is a recurring uh, characteristic. So yeah, this is the, the fast version of, of this history. But after World War II, of course, there's a, a new or, or fairly new invention that makes it, that is established in the Faroes, which is radio. Uh, Utvark Furia is founded in 1957. It's quite late compared to Iceland and Scandinavia. I believe the Finnish National Radio was founded in 1926. And yeah, for various reasons that have to do with, uh, with uh, uh, yeah, troublesome issues of various kinds that we won't go into detail about now. The, the Faroese Radio was not uh, founded until 1957. And this obviously creates a platform for the first pop bands with Faroese lyrics, Simio Te or Te or Kamaro. And uh, of course, the radio is also a platform for other kinds of music, traditional music and folk music and vocal choir music. And, and yeah, so, so choir music and, and uh, brass bands and and uh, communal singing, these are all uh, traditions that are being practiced in the other Nordic countries, and they came to the Faroe Islands early in, in the 20th century. And with the radio, you have a, a platform for all of this. Um, so my PhD project is to examine how notions of tradition are negotiated in curriculums in a music educational context. And I'm going to do that. I, I'm doing that by looking at the closer at the concept of the Faroese as it pertains to music, the role of notions of tradition and identity. How do we understand these concepts and what theoretical perspectives can be used to, to, to properly uh, dig into these ideas and what lies behind them. And also uh, by, I'm, I'm doing this by looking at how music education is practiced in the Pharaoh's educational system. And I'm doing this as a two part study. Uh, there's a theoretical part where I will construct the conceptual map, and key terms, concepts, and theory, which I am outlining in a literature review and then I'm also developing concurrently a method chapter and hopefully the literature review and the method chapter will strengthen each other in collaboration with the supervisors, which is a team from uh, Norway and Scotland and the Faroe Islands. Uh, and then there's the interview part where I will be focusing on interviews with teachers in music. And the public school teaching is the setting. Of course, the, the educational system as a whole is very interesting, but the public school is, is the setting for my research because the public school is a very important um, 
setting for music and engaging with music for, for all people. So the background for the project, if we have a look at now, I have been talking a bit about the historical perspective. The background today is that singing and music have had a significance in public school teaching, and I'm looking at how it is today, and I'm going to hopefully contribute to, to a more solid uh, knowledge about how, how the situation is today. And there are also music schools who offer tuition from beginner to upper secondary school level. And if we look at the, the music culture or the music scene, if you will, today, uh, from an institutional perspective, uh, we are doing pretty good. There are record companies and music festivals and music venues and bands, artists, composers, and ensembles who are doing quite well, both at home and abroad. And Faroe, Faroese media is representing and encouraging Faroese musical culture to a certain degree. The national radio does this also. And yeah, we who work with music have our issues with how they uh, conduct themselves and, and, and the priorities. And, but, but I have to acknowledge that, uh, that they do play a lot of Faroese music and they do cover the, this music. And, and who, who else would uh, accept the, the Faroese national radio? So if there were if there are two uh, forms of music, traditional forms of music that are like the main ones that are our, that are the points of pride for Faroese, if we talk about music and singing and lyrics, it would be the communal singing, singing together at many different settings, both formal and informal. Uh, it can be everything from a graduation to a wedding to a to a birthday, also at parties informally. And of course, there are various challenges to this uh, communal singing with today with digital culture and Spotify. And who, who needs singing when you have Spotify and Netflix and TikTok and, and all the others? But, but this is still doing fairly well, the, the singing. And, and then there's the chain dance, which is also a, a very iconic. Uh, traditional form of music, which is still uh, considered to be a, a living, living uh, cultural heritage. And both of these uh, forms of music are reenacted each year at a very symbolic event, which is Olaf Sokka, the national holiday of the Faroe Islands, with a chain dance where, where there's midnight singing at midnight and thousands of people show up, sometimes maybe 10,000 people. This photo to the left does not cover the whole crowd, but the white building there is the is the parliament, Laktingje. So that's the square in Torsan, where people show up and they sing these 15 to 20 songs. So that's quite unique. It's just, it's not a sports event. It's just music that we agree upon, songs that we all agree upon. And then afterwards, the, the uh, people start dancing uh, the chain dance, Ormerin Lenche, which is one of the heroic poems, also with uh, thousands of participants. And the experts, the, the, the specialists, the people who engage in dance societies and are really good at dancing, they frown upon this dance because there's a lot of drunk people. It's a bit chaotic. But other people think it's great. They just see, okay, this is just something that happens because people feel like doing it. So there's there's like this tension between the specialists and the general public, interestingly. Because in earlier times, in pre-modern times, there, there was no distinction between specialists and, and the general public. It was just a, a part of everyday life. Um, yeah. So interestingly, when we talk about music tradition and school curriculums, uh, neither of these forms of tradition are belong exclusively to any one public school subject. If we look at the curriculums, chain dance and the kvaya are mentioned in the curriculums for the music and Faroese subjects. They're kind of spread out and maybe in a few others as well. 
uh, the the chain dance does not have its own uh, curriculum. Uh, and it is also required in the public school law that morning assembly singing should be a part of the regular school day. That's what it says. But how the different schools apply it, and that's that varies a lot. So these uh, this is these are both uh, both these traditions are a good case for cross disciplinary teaching activities. But whose duty is it? Is it the music teacher or the fireworks teacher? I'm focusing on on the the music teachers in my uh, study, but the fireworks teachers do a lot of good work having to do with both communal singing and chain dance. So the expected impact of my uh, PhD project is to point the way forward for music education in the Faroes and clarifying what the role of notions of tradition can be in future music education and practice, to open up new possibilities for scholarship, to potentially provide insights into how notions of tradition are negotiated in small Northern nations trying to construct and maintain local identities in the midst of globalization and digital culture, and to produce a podcast series engaging with dig digital culture. And yeah, I would like to end with a comment on what Kalpana said about how, how we as Faroese perceive ourselves and how we how inclusion works, that, that we are very preoccupied with this idea of being very small, and having made it, we survived. We managed to get our part of the big uh, late modern late modernity cake, and we're having it. But if we look inside of internally at Faroese society, we we have lots of minorities, and we also with regards to to traditional music and singing and dancing. That how do we include people in this? How do we make this meaningful? in a in a multicultural and multilingual society so and, and how do we make this relevant to to the kids out there this is a, a pressing issue so thank you thank you Knut, with you Han, for you for your another very very interesting and fascinating lecture about fairy music tradition and i as i understood now uh, you have very like strong own music tradition there. Yeah. In Fairy Island. Yeah, that's what I understand. Yeah. yeah, it's it's strong and and but it's uh, today it's very diverse. I mean, the popular music of the Faroes is quite globalized, or maybe you mm, could okay. say it's localized. There's a, mm. for example, there's a lot. There's a couple of of rap artists who who make rap in Faroese. Mm. And obviously, they look up to their American heroes and others. And, <laughs> but they also they also rap in, in Faroese, and and their viewpoint is from a Faroese perspective. And yeah, so many different kinds. Mm. But the, the 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 traditional music is some sort of of inspiration. Yeah. Yes. 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 Wow. Very interesting. It makes me to want to go even more to visit your your island this presentation about music but do you have some comments or questions to knut can i ask i will just ask a short question um do you you uh, believe that the music uh, tradition and history in the faroe islands is it uniquely fairies or is it uh, comparable to for example I Iceland mm. or the other Scandinavian countries uh it's it is in some ways comparable to Iceland but uh, but the story for for Iceland is that they lost their traditional music as a living heritage for example in Iceland they had the the chain dance more or less but today that only exists on recordings. There's only individuals who know who know uh, the the their 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 kvaya. Uh, and I I'm not sure if if there are any living representatives of this or if it only exists on recordings. Because the the, I, the biggest difference is that Iceland became very modernized and urban. I mean, Reykjavik, 
early, early in the 20th century is starting to be a real big city uh, compared to the size of the country and the population. So a lot of people moving to Reykjavik and, and what happens when you move? It's the same story everywhere. When you move from the countryside to the big city, you become, you are taken from the context where the traditions used to make sense. And then you, you become something else and you, 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 you become a, a modern, modern person or something. Um, so it was from, from what I've understood and from the, the sources that I have engaged with that deal with Icelandic music, uh, people had this idea that, that their, their traditional music was somehow backwards looking. It was kind of uh, provincial and, and, and unmodern. And, and it, it ended up in a very different context. And also they have the, the sagas and a very strong you know, lit written uh, literature uh, tradition. So I, I think the, the, the written literature of Iceland become, became a very strong part of their nation building. And for the pharaohs, music actually plays a huge role in, in nation building. So that's also something that my project is, is dealing with. Mm. Very interesting. Thank you so much.